had NMR spectroscopy at some time in your past, probably as part of an organic chemistry course, then you are likely aware of the terms singlet, doublet, triplet, and quartet. Not that quartet, this quartet. These are the classic coupling patterns that we see in proton NMR spectroscopy. And frankly, I find that when I've tried to help students interpret spectra or uh, uh, when students first encounter this in even in the NMR class, they will often want to focus on the coupling patterns at the expense of everything else. And they are the most subtle and hard to interpret bits of information in an NMR spectrum. So I, that's usually a mistake. For example, I've had plenty of students over the years who will look at, say, a triplet pattern and they get all excited. Oh, look, that's a triplet. Uh, that must mean there are three hydrogens. Oh, no, wait, that means there are three hydrogens nearby. No, that, that doesn't sound right. Maybe it's four hydrogens. Maybe it's two hydrogens. Oh, I don't know. And they get frustrated and realize that NMR is like trying to drink out of a fire hose. It's just too confusing and can't be done readily. Um, that's certainly not the case, but it is an example of trying to, I think, leap on the most subtle and difficult to interpret part of a spectrum, when in reality you can get an awful lot of information, as we've seen, from the simpler things like the sample history, the number of resonances, the integrations, and certainly the chemical shifts. The coupling patterns are, cl are critically important, and yes, we are diving wholesale into them now, but they they are, I, I like saving them you know, for later. That's why we're looking at them later in the course here. Uh, after we get comfortable with the other sources of information in NMR spectroscopy. Now, in addition to the four patterns that we talked about, the singlet, doublet, uh, triplet, and quartet, there are certainly plenty of others uh, out there. There is the pentet, there is the sextet, and yes, you do have, that is what it's called, and you do have to have your maturity hot, hats on for this one. There is the septet. In theory, there would be the octet, uh, and we'll talk more about uh, later why I don't have a picture of that one right now. The nonet. And then there are some of the more subtle or uh, convoluted patterns. There is the doublet of doublets. There is another version or another type of doublet of doublets. There is, for goodness sakes, the septet of doublets. I, I look at that pattern and I just get all quivery inside thinking about it. There is the, oh, here it comes, doublet of doublet of triplets. I look at that pattern and, and it just brings a tear to my eye. It's so beautiful. It is just such a marvelous thing to see in an NMR spectrum. Even beyond these, there is what is sometimes referred to as the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one triplet. You see this in carbon spectrum some spectra sometimes. It's the chloroform Solomon peak. And in fact, in my way of thinking, sometimes the difference between a student who understands something about NMR and a real NMR spectroscopist is do they understand why the, the carbon signal of chloroform from deuterated chloroform is a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one triplet. Before we're done, you will know why that happens. Most students, when they uh, are learning this, tend to uh, think about the splitting patterns, tell you about the number of hydrogens nearby. And yes, that is one interpretation, but a, a slightly broader and more useful, ultimately, interpretation is not the number of hydrogens nearby, but the number of spin states nearby. And so that's the one I'm going to kind of keep making reference to as we move along. Often when I talk about this stuff in, with, with students, I find it useful to kind of make up some 
simple fake molecules just using X's and Y's and things to represent other atoms that aren't hydrogen, but I don't really care what they are. And for our first one, I, I'm going to make up a molecule that is, uh, that is not symmetric. So we see an X and a Y here on the left and right, just to make sure there's no mirror plane in this thing. And X and Y and Z, as you see here, whatever they are, whatever other groups they are, they are not hydrogens. There's only two hydrogens that we're going to look at here, labeled HA and HB in this really simple little molecule for a moment. And as we've talked about now, hydrogen A has available to it two spin states in the big honk and mag magnetic field, one aligned with, one aligned against the magnetic field, the big magnetic field, one slightly lower in energy than the other. The energy difference is subtle, but we can probe it with photons, E equals H nu, all that fun stuff. We also know now that those two states are nearly equally populated. In other words, just slightly over 50% of them are in the low energy state, slightly under 50% of them are in the high energy state, but there is a significant number in both. And that will be true for all hydrogens that we look at, all nuclei we look at in our molecule. And I want you to realize that if HA, hydrogen A, and hydrogen B are on adjacent carbons, they are relatively close to each other on the grand scheme of things. It's space. They are proximate to each other. And that means that it is possible to imagine, at least, that magnetic information on one nucleus can influence the other. So if you remember about magnetic fields, they do uh, extend into space away from the source of the magnetism. I've shown some examples of that kind of behavior before. I want to show you a different, a slightly different one here because it, it helps make the illustrate the point that I'm trying to make. Now what I'm going to show you is an apparatus that shows magnetic field lines very nicely. And what it is is a bunch of pieces of plastic that look something like this. Now what these are are little pieces of metal and they're, they're on little spindles, so they, they turn freely. And if you think this piece of plastic looks like, looks like it's broken, it is. Uh, it comes from an apparatus that I use to demonstrate magnetic fields in my classes. And uh, a few years ago, I was doing this in an NMR class, actually. And the student who I was showing it to uh, actually picked the apparatus up and they managed to break it. Uh, so this is the broken piece. Here, uh, that student no longer lives, uh, and uh, but the apparatus can still be used. And so I want to show it to you this way. Now here's the apparatus uh, with all of the different parts or all the different little pieces of metal. Uh, hopefully, kind of mostly randomized because they are uh, pointing in whatever direction they want to be, just like. Uh, uh, protons outside the big hunk and magnetic field can orient themselves wherever they want to. And now I'm going to put the magnet in place and watch what happens. Very definite pattern now. You can see the magnetic field extending away from the magnet quite a ways. And the point about this is going to simply be this. When we have two hydrogens on adjacent carbons, one sits in at least the outer edges of the magnetic field of the other. One of them may be here. Uh, this in our demonstration molecule could be considered HB. And HA is over here at this position nearby. And it is therefore in the magnetic field of HB. Now here's the critical idea. HB has available two different spin states. It is possible for it to be nearly half of the time in this orientation and the other half of the time, and yes, all I'm really doing is taking my magnet out and turning it over, in this orientation. That means Hydrogen A will feel two different effects from hydrogen B. One with its north pole pointing up, let's say. One with its north pole pointing down. Technically, 
hydrogen B in its low energy spin state versus hydrogen B in its high energy spin state. The takeaway message from that is simply this. If hydrogen A feels two different spin states nearby, hydrogen B in its low energy state, hydrogen B in its high energy state, almost 50% of the time one or the other, then we will see hydrogen A's signal split into two. One of them will be the uh, resonant, the, the frequency of protons in the big honk and magnetic field, plus the shielding constant information, the chemical shift that makes HA different from hydrogen B in our spectrum. But now there's a new influence. Half of the time, there will be plus the magnetic field from hydrogen B. Half of the time, minus the magnetic field from hydrogen B. And so, instead of measuring one signal for hydrogen A, we measure two. They will be very close to each other. This magnetic field influence is the weakest of all, but especially given uh, quantum mechanics gift to NMR are really very high, narrow, very high resolution peaks. We can detect the two spin states near hydrogen A when we measure its spectrum. And so this is the observation that leads to the you know, simplistic idea, but it is still a useful one, that says it, if the hydrogen you are observing say at chemical shift 4.0 ppm, has on the adjacent carbon one proton, then the signal at 4 ppm will be split into two. Technically, we will say it will be split into a doublet. We're going to finish up our look at the basic uh, coupling patterns and a little bit about how they work down here on the light board because I need to uh, be able to kind of draw a few pictures and point out a couple of things. So here I've reproduced the simple little molecule that we were talking about uh, a moment ago, uh, HB non-symmetric non molecule with no other protons in there. And we're focusing on HA. That's the one we're observing. I'll even put a little arrow pointing at it here. That's the one we're observing. And what we are, what the coupling patterns tell us is what are the spin states nearby? Now nearby is HB. So I've written out here are the spin states for HB. Uh, it's only one proton and so it has two options available to it. About half the time it'll be looking like this. About half the time it'll be looking like that. Low energy, high energy spin states. Now, I am going to introduce one more of those little quantum mechanics counting type equations, and it looks like this. This is simply 2ni plus 1. And what that stands for is the number of non-degenerate spin states nearby. I'm going to come back to that phrase, non-degenerate spin states, in a few moments, but we'll work with it right now. In a sense, when we look at this molecule here, Hydrogen A has 2n plus 1 spin states non-degenerate spin states nearby. Now, that calculation, what it refers to is n is the number of magnetic nuclei nearby one of them. I is the spin quantum number of those magnetic nuclei. Here it's a hydrogen and so one half plus one. And if you do that calculation, sure enough it comes out to be exactly two. Okay. In other words, there are two non-degenerate spin states nearby, near hydrogen A, Therefore, its signal is split into two, into the classic, you guessed it, doublet.
Now, what I'm going to do is expand our picture here a little bit. Um, now we're going to consider the case when hydrogen A has two neighbors, when hydrogen B is actually a group of two. So a moment with a magic eraser, and away we go. Now our test molecule has changed a little bit. We still have HA, and that is the one we are going to be observing. But over here in the adjacent carbon, I now have a group of two. HB, I've labeled them both HB, but now there's two of them there. Now, first, I'm going to repeat this calculation and then show you the consequences of that calculation by doing a couple of spin state diagrams. When we have HA with two neighboring hydrogens like this, we are now going to say HA has 2n plus 1 non-degenerate spin states nearby. That calculation now looks like this. 2 times 2 times 1 half plus 1. And if you do that calculation, and it's a pretty simple one, three non-degenerate spin states nearby. Now here's where they come from. Now, what I'm going to do is diagram here the spin states, all the possible spin states for hydrogen B. And when I'm doing these, especially for you know, more than just one nucleus, I find myself, to keep it straight in my own head, and sometimes that's a difficult thing to do, is to consider the high energy and low energy ends first. For example, the lowest energy way to arrange two magnetic nuclei, HBs, in the Big Honkin magnetic field is to have them both pointing north pole to south pole with HB. That's the lowest energy possible way of doing it. On the opposite end, here is the highest energy possible way of doing it. Okay? Now, in between, there are a couple of other arrangements that, that are neither as good as this one, where both of these little magnets are north pole to the south pole of the big one, or as bad as this one, where the, these two, the two little magnets are north pole to the north pole of the big one. There are a couple of arrangements in between. And one of them would look like this, where we essentially split the difference between, between the two. Remember, HB, this HB has two spin states available, half the time in one, half the time in the other. This HB has two spin states available, half the time in one, half the time in the other. Here's one of them now, where one of them is aligned with, one of them is aligned against the big magnetic field. But realize, I could do this a different way. I could do it that way. And in fact, that is all of the possible spin state combinations that exist for both members of HB, both aligned with the magnetic field, both aligned against the magnetic field, and two different ways of aligning one with, one against. Since these two are of exactly the same energy, those two are degenerate. Remember, any states that are degenerate simply means they have exactly the same energy. So while there are a total of one, two, three, four spin states available for all of the different members of hydrogen B, there are actually three non-degenerate spin states. And furthermore, of the four possible spin states, this one will be occupied about one quarter of the time. This one about one quarter of the time. This one about one quarter of the time. That one about one quarter of the time. But since these two are degenerate, then this degenerate group will be seen half the time. So look what that means. HA has three non-degenerate spin states nearby. Therefore, it's going to HA's signal will be split into three. Furthermore, it will look like this. It's going to be called a one to two to one 
triplet, where the two outer peaks are roughly the same height. The central peak is twice as big as the two outers. One outer peak, the other outer peak, here is a, where the central peak is coming from. A quarter of the time in here, quarter of the time there, half the time HB are arranged this way. That is the origin of the triplet, and in proton spectra, we will call that a triplet, but technically, and sometimes it's important to make this distinction, this is technically a one to two to one triplet. We'll see other types of triplets in just a little bit. Now, we're going to do one last example of this, and that is we're going to make group B have three members. In other words, this is going to become a methyl group, and we're going to look at what that means for our friend hydrogen A. Once again, a little bit with a magic eraser, and away we go. Still observing hydrogen A. Don't care what these are, but they aren't hydrogen. On the adjacent carbon are now three, uh, three hydrogens in one group, three members of the group known as hydrogen B, a methyl group. Now, doing a quick little calculation here for a moment. Hydrogen A now has 2Ni plus 1, two, three neighboring hydrogens. Each of these hydrogens is spin one half. And if you do that quick calculation, it comes out four. Four non-degenerate spin states nearby. Therefore, when we observe hydrogen A, its signal is going to be split into four, the quartet. Now, I want to also show you where the ratios, why some of the peaks are taller than others in a quartet, where those ratios come from. Now, this tells us how, how it splits pretty easily, but it doesn't tell us necessarily what the ratios of the peaks are. So here's where they come from. Now, again, I'm going to take all three of these hydrogens and dream up the very lowest energy, best way to arrange them. And that would, of course, be North Pole to South Pole, all three of them with a big magnetic field. On the opposite side of things is the very worst way of arranging them. And that's pretty simple to grasp. And now we have to start thinking carefully about how many the arrangements in between. And this time around, there is an arrangement that is almost as good as this one, but not quite. There's an arrangement almost as bad as this one, but not quite. There are actually two other ways of doing it here. This one would be two up and one down. So it's still an advantage. It's still lower in energy, but not as good as this one. The alternative here is two downs and an up. Not as bad as this one, but not as good as this one either. And here's the kicker. While there's only one way to point them all up, while there's only one way to point them all down, there are actually three ways to have two up, one down. That one works. And that one works. And there are three ways of doing it here as well. Realize there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total combinations here. These two are unique. These three are all degenerate. These three are all degenerate. They are all identical in energy. These three are degenerate with each other. These three are degenerate with each other, but they are but this group and that group are different. This is lower energy than this one. So there are eight total arrangements possible. But one, two, three, four, four non-degenerate spin states. Furthermore, one eighth of the time, all the three of these hyd hydrogen B protons will be here. Roughly one eighth of the time here three eighths of the time, three eighths of the time. And 
I don't really care about the eights. Look at the numerators here. One, three, three, one. That is the ratio of the four peaks of the quartet. The quartet has this appearance to it. Small peak, bigger peak, bigger peak, smaller peak. And it is technically called a one to three to three to one quartet where the two central peaks are ideally equal in height to each other and approximately three times as high as the two outer peaks. One outer peak, central peak three times as high, central peak three times as high, and the last outer peak. The 1331 quartet. Now, you can repeat exactly this type of analysis for greater numbers of hydrogens for the pentet, the sextet, the septet, and so forth, and see where you get the conclusion uh, that, you know, the, the situation that gives the pentet four neighboring hydrogens it has five non-degenerate spin states nearby producing the pentet. This sort of analysis will get you the ratios, the expected ratios of the pentet. I will show you a shortcut to that in just a moment, though. Uh, for all of these types of uh, coupling patterns. So once again, the magic eraser and a couple more things to look at. Now I want to show you a shortcut to getting the ratios of the peaks that we see in proton spectra. Um, you know, the, the ratios, the 1, 2, 1 triplet, the 1, 3, 3, 1 quartet, and so forth. And going, doing all that spin state analysis, while very interesting, um, is a little bit tedious. You can shortcut it this way. And so I'm drawing a one, and then I'm going to draw to the left and to the right on the next line down two more ones. And then I'm going to draw a one. Now watch what I do. I'm simply going to add these two numbers together and write it down in the center, and then go out here with another one. The next line begins with a one. Add these two together. Add these two together. And then finally, another one. You may have seen this before. You probably did in an algebra class or something. This is technically called Pascal's triangle. And it also gives the coefficients in a binomial expansion. It's a useful little thing. It pops up in math quite often. So the ratio, this, is, this would be the ratio for one peak. That's your singlet. The ratio is one. You know, surprise there. Doublet, where the peak heights are the same. Okay? One peak, two peaks. Triplet. Triplet, a one, two, one triplet. One, two, one triplet. Quartet. The one, three, three, one quartet. So the ratios uh, of the peaks in a pentet is pretty easy to come up with now. One, four, six, four, one pentet, and so forth and so on. And so if the nucleus that the, you're observing is coupled to is near spin one-half nuclei, protons most commonly, then Pascal's triangle gives a very nice and convenient shortcut to being able to determine the expected ratios um, quite easily. Finally, I want to show you one last coupling pattern. You've, I've already shown it to you before. I'll show it to you again here. And it is the solvent peak of deuterated chloroform. So here is uh, what we're looking at in, when we look at that solvent peak, uh, CdCl3, where about 1% of the time, by natural abundance, the carbon in there is a carbon-13 rather than the more common carbon-12 magnetic nucleus, and therefore we do observe it in our C13 NMR spectra. Here's what it looks like. Now you've seen this a number of times in all of the carbon spectra that you've looked at, and I'm going to just sketch the pattern here. It is what is referred to as a 1 to 1 to 1 triplet, not the 1 2 to 1 triplet. Those ratios from Pascal's triangle are very nice, but as I emphasized, they apply to spin one-half nuclei 
most commonly protons, only. Now here, the C13 is proximate to, near, a deuterium. Now you remember deuterium, two heavy hydrogen, but you know that is the, sim the, the symbol for it, that we almost always just simply call it deuterium rather than heavy hydrogen. And so that's the symbol we use. And quick reminder, that one is a spin one nucleus. It is not spin one half. Two I plus one equals three. That means when a deuterium is in the big honking magnetic field, it will have available to it not two orientations, three. One will be low in energy, one will be high in energy, one will be in the middle. I use little arrows, although for a nucleus with a spin quantum number greater than one half, it's probably not entirely accurate, but it gets the point across. One of those will be oriented like this, the lowest energy. One of them oriented like this. That would be the highest energy. Now, using arrows pointing either up or down, north pole to north pole, or north pole to south pole with a big magnetic field, this is where it gets a little wonky. The third arrangement, in my mind, I always draw it with a little arrow pointing sideways. In other words, a proton up or down, and that's it. A deuterium spin one nucleus in the big magnetic field, up, down, or sideways. That's a quick and easy way to think about it, I think. Now, here's the critical thing. Each of these are the three possible spin states, and since they would be all nearly equally populated, approximately one-third of your deuteriums will be here at any one moment in time, one-third here, one-third there. Notice the numerators, one, one, one. Also, the carbon-13 of C, D, C, L, 3, okay, has 2 N, I, plus 1 equals, now watch this, 2, one deuterium, spin quantum number of that deuterium, one plus one equals three. Okay, has three spin states. Deuterium spin states nearby. So our C13 has three spin states in the deuterium nearby. Each of those spin states is populated roughly equally about one third of the time. One, 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 triplet. This is, again, what I like to think of as the little fact that distinguishes people who use NMR to answer questions like, did I or did I not synthesize the product I was expecting to make? And NMR spectroscopists, the folks who study NMR in, on its own, uh, because it, you don't need to know why the solvent peak uh, in C13 spectra for deuterated chloroform is a 111 triplet. It just is. It's always there at 77 ppm. You make use of it and go on. But a real NMR spectroscopist knows a little bit more about the number, about the relation between you know, prox proximate spin states and spin quantum numbers, and has a firm idea of why it's a 111 triplet, and is able to predict, might also be a, something for an assignment sometime, I don't know, that if you have other solvents that you might use, for example, deuterated acetonitrile, 
where now the carbon-13 has three spin-1 deuteriums nearby. Boy, that would give an interesting pattern, I'll bet. Well, we'll think about that later. And so that will wrap up our introduction to the basic coupling patterns, the singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, and so forth, give you a good idea of the origins of those patterns, and also where some more exotic type patterns like this one tend to come from. From here now, we move on to uh, thinking about something called the coupling constant and what are called multiple coupling patterns. That's the doublet of doublets or the doublet of triplets that I introduced earlier. And how we make use of all of these patterns to tell us or to get us even more information about our molecules.